Hello. Hi. Hi, Simone. How are you? Hey. Hey. Great to see you. You too. Hey, Judy. Hey, Lucy. nice to see you. Hey, hey. Ben, Jeanette. I don't know who you are, Jeanette. Who are no, you? I know. I don't know you either. <laughs> How'd you get in here, Jeanette? <laughs> Crazy lucky. Simone and Judy uh, and Wendy, they're like, they've almost been to every one of these, I think. Yeah, no, no, I've missed a few lately, but I've been Nice all. to see you all. Good to see you. Nice to be ben? here. Hello. Hi, Ben. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Um, friend Stephen Galvin um, sent me the link, so I hope you would accept me as a Zoom crasher. Absolutely. Sure. Welcome. So we've got um, Jen Kierstad to my right, I guess, is our nutritionist, Mountain Tech nutritionist. And my name is Kirk. I'm the program director. And Alex beside me on the other side is our technical wizard. He's our owner of the business and in our mark, main marketing man. So tonight we're here to talk about superfoods, as most of you know. And um, Jen's got some great ideas to share with you all. And maybe Alex is gonna do a little uh, uh, poll. And I guess the only way we could probably pull this off is if you were to put into the chat right now, your favorite superfood, go ahead and type it in. And that's from all time. We could be going way back to spirulina <laughs> or currently right up to cauliflower. Whatever your favorite superfood has been in the last 10 years or so, throw it into the chat and we'll just have, have a little fun with that. Sinead, you too. Ooh. Good one. Yeah, I think it's not a superfood. It's sort of a superfood. Anything that we kind of really focus on like crazy and start making like menu items at restaurants about them. Like yeah. Chia pudding or avocado toast. Come on, those are superfoods. Yep, you're right. All right. Super expensive foods. <laughs> yeah. And agriculturally adjusting the whole agricultural world to make it possible and available. Jen, did you put yours in? No, because I okay. thought we were going to talk about it. Yeah. We'll save Jen's for in a minute. Okay. Should we get started? Where are we at? Yeah, we're just five yeah. after. Um, I think we'll have some people trickling in. Sure. So let's, let's start. Um, well, actually, I want to start with Jen's superfood first, and then I'm going to ask Jen, what is a superfood? Why is it called a superfood? And what are the health benefits of a superfood? And what do these superfoods do to our body? So what's your first, what's your superfood, Jen? My favorite superfood? Yeah, yeah. of yeah. all time. <laughs> you know, when, and when you asked that question, I really had to think about it because I have, I have several, but I do think I would say, I would say a blackberry. <laughs> oh, I haven't seen many big sale items around blackberries. <laughs> well, I'm thinking of, and this kind of leads me into when you ask me what a superfood is, it kind of segues me into Perfect. the explanation of a superfood and sort of getting into, if you think about the, the, the marketing term and the, the sort of the very overused word superfood, you would automatically, like you mentioned, think of maybe chia pudding or avocado toast or kale or cauliflower. Blueberries are a really great example of a very sort of ultra marketed superfood. But a superfood really means a, a food that's really high in, in nutrient value, high in antioxidants in particular. So anything from vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin E, selenium, um, beta carotene, they can have lots of different antioxidant components in a superfood. 
but the ones that I feel like get sort of the, the get highlighted, like you're saying, like kind of get put on a pedestal, aren't necessarily any more super than a lot of other foods. So I, that's what, sort of why I said I was going to choose the blackberry because really to me, a blackberry is just as super as a blueberry. It just hasn't been, I think, maybe as marketed as, as such. But as far as antioxidant levels go, as far as phytonutrients, Blackberries are up there with all the other berries. Do you, Jen, do you think if blackberries didn't have really difficult thorns for picking that um, maybe they would be it more would be a super food? <laughs> sure. You know, I actually have a thornless blackberry bush. <laughs> <laughs> I just planted one of those. If that well. makes a difference, if that makes a difference or not. But really, like the juicy, delicious, like popping in your mouth, like how sweet they are, and that beautiful black purple color that. Often the colors of the food are indicators of the antioxidants and the phytonutrients, which really are the plant's protection. So plants need protection against sun damage, UV rays, insects, disease, chemicals. So those plants contain antioxidants to protect themselves. And then when we consume those foods, which again, I, I, I think there's so many super foods out there, more than just the ones that you're seeing marketed so strongly, um, then we also are ingesting all of those really powerful antioxidant protection qualities. So to pretty much a superfood, let's say, let's pick a goji berry, for example. Sure. Sure. When goji berries came on, um, everybody wanted them in their smoothie, everyone and put them into their cereal combinations. They were like going into everything. It was like the, something that we couldn't pronounce. Nobody knew really how to say it, but all of a sudden everybody was on the market and everybody thought, okay, it's going to have more than a blueberry or a blackberry. It's going to have more than anything else in the world. It's all going to be in one beautiful little package pill that we could take. And then what's going to happen? Right. Right. Great, great question. So really, will one food be the magic bullet? You know, I certainly don't believe that's the case. We really are into balance at Mountain Trek and variety in our opinion is so important so that you're getting a wide array of different nutrients from different foods. The other issue, of course, is where are these foods coming from? And the goji berry is a good example of a food coming from extremely, you know, far distances, other continents, you know, to get to us. And then there's also the issue of overeating, over consuming a food because it's been labeled so super and so high in, in nutrient value, um, becoming even maybe deficient in other things because you're only focusing so much on a few certain foods. Mm -hmm. um, then potentially even, you know, developing sensitivities to things because we eat them so often and so much. Right. So rather than eating the rainbow of spectrums of colors with each color of the plants having different phytonutrients and minerals and vitamins, we can kind of get locked into a sector For based sure. on, on it being popular. Absolutely. And really the superfood trends are sort of in a sense like diets, you know, like you're, like you notice every few years, one gets put up on that pedestal and gets sort of rave reviews from, from everybody. And then in a, another few years from now, it'll be, it'll be something else. Yes. Yeah. Now, now besides it, there being um, sort of a, where we get locked into only a certain spectrum of food when we get tied into a superfood like avocado, for example, and we're getting only our vitamin E and some of our essential fatty acids out of that uh, particular plant. Um, is, is there also a problem that we're getting things that aren't local? Like I often think like my body is used to being in the nature of this place. I'm drinking the water from this place. I'm, I'm breathing the air from this place. In a way, the composition of my cells and everything are of the Kootenays where I live. But yet, if I'm eating stuff from Africa and South America and the Philippines and everything, that's a recent thing for human beings. Like human beings have typically only eaten where they've lived. And what's the value of getting things from all over the world versus eating from where you live? That's a, such a great question too. And it's true when you study sort of all of these different tribes and cultures from all over the world and what diet works for them, it's a diet that's local. 
you know, that's the only food that is available to them. They have no other option. They don't have 24 hour grocery stores or Uber <laughs> to, to order their food. So yeah, they're forced into eating locally. And some of those cultures just happen to be some of the most healthy in the world. And I, I, I completely agree with you. I feel like eating foods, especially back to sort of eating seasonally, I, not to sound too hippie about it, but when you eat sort of as mother nature intends and foods that grow in their appropriate seasons, they do offer the body different things. Mm -hmm. You know, as you even mentioned in the detox lecture, when spring, you know, is approaching and the greens are popping up, that's when we're intended to consume them to help with the process of detoxification, right? And then we move into summer and foods become more abundant and we can eat things even, you know, there's even foods like like a grape skin, um, resveratrol, that protects the grape from UV rays. So let's say we're eating more fruits and vegetables that contain this UV damage protector in the sun from the heat. So I think that there's something really big to eating foods that are seasonally produced for us to consume. And I guess also local means the more we eat local, the more it's gonna be fresh. And the fresher, especially the plant kingdom is, the less loss of nutrient density, right? Is that correct? 100%. Even growing foods in their season, it's easier to do that. You're not needing or required to necessarily be using the chemicals, the pesticides, the fungicides either. So those foods can certainly be much more organic that way too. Right. For sure. Um, Jen, where does all the coconut water come from? <laughs> You know, I've, I have, I've been to Central America. I went, I went to Southeast Asia after high school. I was, I was definitely a girl that got, <laughs> that was guilty of buying those, those coconuts and like relishing in the deliciousness of that exotic um, water. The machete, the machete top. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Raw. That's right. That's right. And what a treat really. And, and I remember being in Costco with my family in the United States and, and, and yes, yeah, seeing cases and cases and cases of this coconut water and everyone was putting it in their smoothie. <laughs> yes. And such a good question. I mean, where is it coming from? I mean, it's coming from very far away from here, for sure, from rainforests from all over the world. I mean, and, and certainly, yes. I mean, whenever you're traveling in these places, are you seeing copious amounts of, of coconuts, you know, no. no. So it does make me, it does make me question and wonder. It's, it's true. Where is this food coming from? What are the potential devastating effects it's having to our environment? How far are these foods also traveling to get into our Costco's, into our super grocery stores and to get into those little, you know, perfect Tetra packs? Yeah. I mean, I just bought an organic coconut water the other day and it says it's from Vietnam. So even that container of coconut water, probably took three coconuts to get that much coconut water into that can. Right. And then it's put into a freighter and shipped all the way over to here. And I don't know, the whole thing seems kind of weird to me. For sure, for sure. I, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, I, I think even just, again, bringing it back to consciousness and mindfulness, which you talk about so much, right? mindfully recognizing, you know, where is this food coming from? How long has it traveled to get to me? Is this food in season? What benefit can that have to my health? You know, right. too. And, and two, when we focus on variety, it gives us more options, more choices, not to be overwhelmed by all the options and choices, but just to also reduce boredom, you know, mm -hmm. to really enjoy what we're eating, to mm -hmm. feel potentially more satisfied because of the color of rainbow on our plate. And I kind of like the idea of getting experimental too. Like I, I'm sure many of you folks order those boxes from the local farmers and you get it put on your front door and you get some weird things in there that you've never cooked with before, like kohlrabi or whatever, Jerusalem artichoke or some kind of turnipy thing. And you look at it and you go, what the heck is this? And what am I going to do with it? But it's kind of like, it's kind of like going traveling. You get to, get something and then get a recipe a book out once you figure out what it is and try different recipes and fit this vegetable that you might have walked right by in the grocery store but ends up coming in the box to your house and it's a great way to experiment with ranges of food tastes and qualities from bitter to you know all the taste buds get to get an exploration out of it and it's true and try something that maybe you never would have picked up before like an eggplant right mm -hmm. yeah 
which is pretty exotic, really. <laughs> so exotic. Yeah, an eggplant, but they, they grow locally. They're in season right now. Yeah, there's so many different beautiful types of squash. We're so lucky. We have yes. like an, such an array, a wide array of foods that we can grow in our soil in North America. So going to the farmer's market this time of year is a great way to get unusual things to try and then a full range of what's in season in the moment when it's most vital, full of potency and vitality and nutrification benefits better than any other time to get that vegetable, right? That's so true. It really from when that moment that food is harvested, right? It, it, the time, you know, goes, goes on and it starts to decrease little by little by little in, in nutrient value. So the sooner you can consume those foods, the more fresh they are, you're absolutely right. The higher in nutrient content that they will be. So Jen, I have a question for you. So yeah. the, the thing that to me seems simple about superfoods is that it's a rule. And in busy lives, hectic lives, we have kids, we have jobs, rules help. It, it cuts out a lot of noise. So if a superfood comes along marketing or not, and we're told if you just eat blueberries, if you just eat blackberries, it keeps it simple. Um, and I understand that the variety is very beneficial. So what would you recommend as some simple rules then that might replace of oh, just eating blueberries, just eating blackberries. Um, seasonal seems like a pretty good rule to simplify things. Are there any others that you would suggest? And yeah, if anyone I'd has love. any other questions, please interject or chat me in the comments and we'll get it asked. Absolutely, yeah. It's Kirk's comment about the CSA boxes, phenomenal. You know, if that's something that you, you have available to you in the city you live in, I think that that can increase variety, you know, tenfold by just having the convenience of that box delivered right to your door. Or right now is the time to visit farmer's markets as well. Like go and, and, and see what foods are available. You'll be so surprised and pick, maybe pick up something you haven't tried before. So I think that that is another benefit of seasonal eating is that when you're choosing foods that are in season, most of them only have a little tiny window. I mean, the strawberry window in my garden's already over. There's no more strawberries anymore. So I had, I was lucky to have them for about three weeks and then they're, they're done. Um, so I think that that just helps you naturally um, avoid the overconsumption of the same things all the time. Hmm. Would, um, we have a question in the chat here and it might be a, a rule with some clarity. Um, around organic, is it worth it to buy organic? So again, we could kind of tie that into seasonal. As I had mentioned, when things are growing in season, there, there's less of a need to necessarily be adding things to them. Or I remember once reading this, this research paper about tomatoes that were being grown in really cold climates. So they were adding, they were genetically modifying them and adding these flounder genes to the tomatoes so that the tomatoes would become more, more cold hardy and that they would have the ability to produce more, um, heavily in colder environments. So really foods are having to be altered at, at such a degree when they're not grown in their natural environment. So that's one way to eat, to choose cleaner food is to go local. Oftentimes there's less chemicals um, and pesticides on locally grown foods because they're grown in their appropriate season. I do feel like as far as organic goes, I have a little bit of a, like a trick. So I am big on buying chemically chemical free foods, you know, spray free, chemical free. I, to me, that's very important to avoid chemicals. You know, chemicals, really, we could call those free radicals in the body. And that's what antioxidants are really good at combating. They help to reduce the damage of these free radicals. Free radicals coming from pollution, cigarette smoke, just smoke in the air. Um, stress can cause really, really um, great um, uh, free radical damage. So when I'm at the grocery store, and I'm scanning around in the produce section and organic is certainly much more expensive. I completely, you know, can understand this. I try to think of what am I consuming um, that maybe I can discard. Like an avocado is a really good example. It has that sort of dinosaur like shell, you know, protecting it. So do I have to necessarily, you know, spend the extra dollar 50 on the organic avocado when I'm just peeling the avocado skin off and, in, and in ingesting just the flesh inside? versus maybe a leafy green where I'm consuming the entire food, the whole food, right? Or even berries, they're really spongy and they have the ability to really soak up a lot of hydration and water, but also chemicals and pesticides. So I kind of try to look at like that, like if the food is a peel, a banana, an orange, an avocado, something I can discard, 
it, it will be helpful. It's not to say that, that food isn't still going to be absorbing through the skin, the skin's permeable, yes, but that might just be helpful in terms of if, if it's kind of coming down to what to buy organic and what not to buy. That's sort of one thing that I try to remind people of. Hey, Jen. I remember, oops, Go ahead, Kirk. Um, Jen, what about certain spices? Like they're talking about um, cinnamon being a great metabolism booster, but then I did some further research search on it and you'd probably need a quarter cup of cinnamon for it to actually do what is required to raise the metabolism. So we get all of these um, blasts about turmeric or cinnamon or these different things that are supposed to, you know, rev us up or do all kinds of anti-inflammatory benefits. But when you dig down into it, you find out that the volume of it to make it work is huge or the consistency of it. You've got to eat curry every single day of your life before that amount of turmeric is going to really be an anti-inflammatory food source. What do you think about that and how do we work with it? Yeah, I mean, great point. I, again, I feel like that it comes down to using the word variety again, you know, when we're choosing and out at the grocery store and maybe out looking to make a chili recipe, like the really great chili recipe from Mountain Trek, for example, there's so many different herbs and spices used. So I think when you incorporate more variety of spices, of herbs, of fruits, of vegetables, of whole grains, of all those macro nutrient foods, then you're also increasing the likelihood that you're going to be eating and absorbing so many different varied nutrients, more than you could ever find in the most perfectly formulated multivitamin, that's for sure. Isn't there a saying variety is the spice of life? Yeah, oh, maybe there should be. <laughs> there is. <laughs> that could apply to a lot of things. <laughs> um, question from uh, the audience here. When looking at nutrient value, um, Backing up, given, given today's new environment, when it's not as easy to go to grocery stores and maybe there's not as many deliveries of seasonal vegetables and we're buying frozen, um, what's the big difference between frozen and fresh? Is there a nutrient difference? Yeah, not, not much. You know, anything that the food goes through, any process, so even, even freezing a food is going to chemically change it in some way, but very, very little. If that is something that needs to be, you know, in your life because of, again, convenience and because you travel a lot, let's say, and when you come home, you need something to eat. So you've got foods kind of stashed in your freezer. I say no problem for, with frozen food. Yeah. And isn't it true, Jen, that frozen is good in a way because it's picked at the optimal ripeness yeah. and then flash, flash frozen rather totally. than Sometimes when we buy other foods, there's been chemicals added to help in the ripening process, whereas frozen foods typically don't have that. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely true. Or even if you kind of look at canned food, John, unfortunately, you know, you're looking at also them being stored in aluminum and maybe leaching out components of from what's found in, that, in those metals. So certainly freezing the food is a really great storage for, for reducing um, aluminum and BPAs and chemicals that way too. Great. Speaking of uh, in-season versus preserved, um, we have a question about Ayurvedic mentality and um, being in season correlating to the Ayurvedic mentality. Do, do we follow that at Mountain Trek? Any mentality related to that? Kirk, we don't you, yeah, you go ahead. Okay. We, we, when we built the Mountain Trek diet, we didn't specifically tie you know, to the macrobiotic system or to the Ayurvedic system. We try to, again, best as we can, what's mostly plant, what's mostly local, what's mostly fresh, and what's the most important to be organic. And then we're looking at color spectrum, like the rainbow, like Jen has always talked about. And so it's not like we're following one particular cultural path. The Ayurvedic path is very old, 3,000 to 5,000 years old from, from India, but we wouldn't just pick that one path, nor would we just pick the macrobiotic path or the vegan path or the paleo path or the, you know, any particular path. We're looking at an omnivoric, mostly vegetable, multiple colors with small amount of protein. 
That um, brings up a good question related to the plate. Jen, you put out an article recently and we shared it on Monday about the concept of creating a super plate. So mm -hmm. rather than focusing on super foods, let's create super plates and that will help with variety and nutrient intake. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? For sure. And it, it's sort of also similar to sort of the composition plate that I draw during the, the mountain trek lectures when I talk about all the different components, all the different macronutrients that we believe are important to be consuming with every meal. So breakfast is a really good example because you've got three major macronutrients going on in the, on the, in the plate or on the bowl. So that's certainly creating a super plate because you've got the phytonutrients, phytochemicals, antioxidants from your fruits and vegetables. That's one com component of the super plate. And then you've got your fats and proteins, which is another third, another component. And then you've got your complex carbohydrates. So I'm just using breakfast as an example because it really does get really diversify and, and include a lot of different um, nutritional components, variety, the potential for color to be there. So that's when I think about a super plate, I sort of think about a really great wholesome breakfast containing that array of macronutrients and vitamins and minerals in your food. Hmm. And so beyond breakfast, yeah. um, what would you define as a super plate? What, what components would be on your perfect breakfast plate, lunch plate, dinner plate? Right. I would have, I would have as much variety as possible. I would have the, as, as many different, you know, macronutrients as possible, fats, proteins, lots of vegetables, fruits that are in season, color, texture. I also feel like taking it a step further in a super plate is, is texture of food, is a crunch potentially, is something's cooked, something raw. I mean, again, getting the maximum enjoyment out of your food. So you're also, um, you know, s mentally and emotionally satisfied just as you are physically satisfied, I think too, makes a super plate. Mm. And I would add to that, Jen, which we try to do at, at the lodge is to try to touch into the five different taste buds sure. so that we're hitting the pleasure centers um, for the brain through good, good quality food. So getting umami, getting bitter, getting sweet, getting sour, getting salty. And then that, again, is diversifying our taste buds rather than just singularly focusing to this typical salt and, and sweet kind of thing that the processed food industry has us attracted to. Absolutely. And another benefit to that is potentially you, you may notice that you, you sort of are craving the junky stuff less when your body's really satisfied and getting all the nutrients that it really needs to function optimally. I'm not saying it erases them. You know, there's no, again, magic bullet to that either, but it really can help. Again, as a former junk food addict, I just found when I, when I started to change my diet into eating whole, less processed foods, that my, that my cravings for the sugar, for the refined salt, for the um, trans fats became, they minimized. It really helped with the impact. And I feel like the intensity of me wanting those other things. I was gonna say, Jen, I totally agree. With me, that just happened with coffee because we couldn't have coffee at Mount Trek. Yeah. <laughs> when I had it uh, at the airport, like, oh my God, Starbucks. Um, it tasted all, I, I didn't like the taste of it. It was only after one week, so to your point. Uh, and, and so have you, have you since, has coffee no longer become a part of your life? <laughs> I, still, I still need my coffee. <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> you just have your, your, the beans that you like and you make it the way you want, for sure. Just one cup, one cup sure. of coffee. No problem. <laughs> it's all about balance, that's great. <laughs> it is amazing to see how your body reacts to removing some of these things, like for me, specifically sugar. I remember the first time I came to Mountain Trek, four or five days in without sugar, we went on a hike and we were lucky enough to come across huckleberries, I believe. And yeah. I remember eating, I had cheating a little bit on the program, but <laughs> eating a handful of huckleberries and could literally feel the sugar coursing through my body. And it was amazing because we're so used to that on our typical diet that we don't, we don't really know how good we can feel and how sensitive we actually are to some of those things. It's so true. So true. Yes, they become so much more powerful. <laughs> and by the way, huckleberries is one of our local superfoods. <laughs> yeah. You weren't cheating. <laughs> okay, good. I, yes, in taking superfoods. Alex, I'm cur curious. Um, did anyone chat in any of their favorite superfoods just to get Oh, yeah. 
spectrum. Yeah, let's let I'll start from the top. I'll skip myself because I put in kale. I mean, Kurt can give a little spiel on kale in a second here. We have sauerkraut. I love that one. That has um, probiotics in it, right? Is yes. That yes, it does. Um, we've got Brussels sprouts, broccoli, garlic, avocado, blueberries, ginger. And then we need to hear from Kirk. Kirk, what would you put in here? I was going to say huckleberries personally, but that's something that actually can't be grown domestically. So it's, it's interesting that you can only get them in, in place, certain places in the mountains and no one's ever been able to um, domesticate them. Ooh. Wow, um, I didn't know that. Yeah, but I did that's want to touch, so touch back to your point about kale. Um, my wife was getting tested for heavy metals and I just wanted to let everybody know and basically was told that her thallium levels were up and thallium is a not a very common heavy metal but um, we did some research where thallium comes from and it comes from smelters which are from mining areas which Mount and Nelson used to be but there's certain plants that draw thallium out of the soil and then store it and so kale happens to be one of the most potent plants on the planet for pulling thallium out of the soil and then storing it in higher and higher degrees. Just like when we are worried about it getting mercury from eating cold water fish, they're the predator fish that are accumulating the mercury that go from the plankton all the way up the food chain to a salmon. The same thing happens with plants. So it's different plants draw different minerals out of the soil and that contributes to their different colors and contributes to different phytonutrients. But then if we're just gonna zone in on one plant like kale and it make it our only green, we're gonna end up accumulating potentially too much of one type of mineral or metal that may end up not being beneficial for us. So going back to Jen's idea of diversity being key, Yes, having kale maybe once or twice a week, but not every single day um, is beneficial. So having kale one day and then chard another day and maybe spinach another day and maybe romaine another day. So we're spreading the greens across, we're spreading the yellows and the purples and the oranges across a variety of different plants so we don't over accumulate the building blocks that those plants are pulling out of the soil. So if we are starting to build our super plate and we're thinking variety and we're thinking seasonal, what's the next step, Jen? Do you start with um, a protein? Do you start with a side, a vegetable? Where do you go next to build your super plate? Yeah, so I think, I think you want to, you certainly also want to think in terms of, of, of meeting, you know, the, the, the basic nutritional needs too. So like you're saying, and, and again, at Mountain Trek for our, every meal we make sure that there is enough protein and proteins often are coupled with fat so you're getting that combo right there um so making sure that yeah you aren't just again going to eat this big beautiful 20 dollar whole food salad that's certainly a super salad and full of lots of antioxidants but again if you're not getting the proteins and the fats then you're going to be hungry again in 20 minutes so i think too making sure that you're getting all the components of a meal that also of course balances blood sugar but that also in, in encourages satiation and that leaves you feeling satisfied not only full of nutrients but that g g is giving your body what it needs at every meal for the energy to feed the brain to feed the body to support metabolism so this might feed in, you were mentioning earlier, you draw your chart, which has been really helpful for our weekend retreats that we've been running, where for breakfast, we have a certain proportion of carbs to proteins to fats. And then that changes for lunch, it changes for dinner. Um, could you quickly review that? And then I think what would be really helpful is if we created an article for that and we'll, we'll share it in a follow up for this. Sure, sure. And th at, at Mountain Trek, because we're, we're being like, ultra specific about what our intentions are while our guests are there where we're only incorporating that complex carbohydrate for breakfast so really the big difference is is in the mornings um, for breakfast upon rising we're encouraging that first meal to have a complex carb as well as a fruit and vegetable as well as a, as a protein and then for your lunch and for your dinner really it's as simple as a quarter portion protein to basically two thirds of your plate, the majority of your plate or your bowl packed full of vibrantly colored vegetables. Mm. Yeah. It, it, you can start that. to build a rule around 
okay, we're going to have variety for three quarters of our plate in the vegetables. They're going to yeah. be seasonal. Sure. And then we're going to have a quarter protein and that con constitutes a super plate. For sure. And even, even in terms of protein, because there are certainly wonderful animal source proteins, but there's fantastic plant source proteins as well, which is why we really are big on beans and legumes, that family, lentils, you know, aduki beans, chickpeas, kidney beans, black beans, there's so many different types of beans you can consume. So I think also diversifying the proteins, whether they're coming from a plant and, and an animal source is important to remember too. Totally. Yeah. The other thing too, I just read not too long ago, Jen, that being that we have several million types of species of bacteria living in our intestinal tract, not, mm -hmm. not individual bacteria cells, but species, species. and each one, has in that ecosystem of 22 feet of tubing that we have in us, has different food that it prefers to live off of, that some of our bacteria needs to live off of cabbage and some of it needs to live off of lentils and some of our bacteria really likes the fiber that's in carrots and others really like the skin of an eggplant. So again, having that variety, it gives us a great variety of bacteria colonies and cultures and families in our guts. And we know now from the gut biome studies that have been, been going on, the more variety of species that we have, the less chance there's going to be negative bacteria in our guts, the more balanced there's going to be. So we have to feed those bacteria with the ver same variety, not only for the phytonutrients that we're getting, but also for food in the fiber world for our gut bacteria. For sure. No, you're right. I, I was reading something so similar about, yeah, one type of, of gut bacteria, like you said, like this, just the skin of the certain bean. I mean, they're really yeah. like yeah, very particular. <laughs> very particular. So even though you buy a probiotic from the store, there's typically only eight species that are manufactured. Meanwhile, we've got a million species, ideally in our guts. So this is why we have to have the variety of food for those species to keep growing and colonizing and being healthy because the more they assimilate the food for us, the more nutrification we get. We don't have the good bacteria working to digest. We don't absorb the selenium and the copper and the zinc and all of the minerals and vitamins that we need for our cellular production. Absolutely. So, so what, what about kefir as a source for probiotics? Is there and so two questions, really. One, kefir, I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that correct. I'm from the Appalachians, so it's not a native food to us. Um, <laughs> we ferment a lot of stuff. It's just mainly put in bottles, and it's got a brown color to it. Um, but so kefir, if you pronounce it, and then um, so how many probiotics do you get with that? And then uh, farmer's cheese, which I think is kefir cheese, but I'm not positive. Does that also have good probiotics in it? Great questions. Yeah, so kefir, like I, I, I say it very similar to you, and I'm never sure exactly if I'm pronouncing it right either, but it's basically like a fermented milk, so it's really similar to, to yogurt. Um, my only caveat with that would be if you're buying it from the store to make sure you're buying plain and unsweetened um, of those products. I wouldn't be able to tell, only to back myself up there, is because if they're sweetened, then you're sort of kind of, in, in a sense, you're feeding the, the gut with good bacteria from the probiotics from the food, but then the sugar is feeding the bad guys. So it's kind of canceling each other out. So you want to make sure it's plain unsweetened with, with no sugar added, which may not taste as enjoyable, but you could maybe add some fresh fruit in there for, sweet, for sweetness. That would be my preference. The thing about fermented foods, it's hard to specify exactly every single you know, probiotic culture found in that food. But that's the beauty of it with, with fermented foods versus a probiotic like Kirk was describing, which typically only has eight different strains of bacteria. Fermented foods offer such a more diverse um, array of probiotic culture. So it's a win-win in, in that sense. As far as farmer's markets cheeses go, I don't, I don't know how I would. I know in some states raw cheese is legal and you can, you can consume raw cheese, which is unpasteurized cheese, which would contain probiotic culture but I know most of the cheese on the market at the grocery store has been pasteurized and that heating process that the food goes through typically destroys most of the probiotic culture found in it so I think unless it's a raw and pasteurized cheese you're not going to be getting very many um, bacterial live bacterial cultures found in, in that in the cheese 
And, and just like Jen's saying, if you've got kefir giving you certain bacteria strains, then you might have sauerkraut for different ones because they like to grow on cabbage. And then you have different ones from kombucha and then you have different ones of, of all, if you try to get a gain variety of different um, cultured food sources, you're going to get a variety of strains. Absolutely. And it's important. I was just working with someone who had, had bought in sauerkraut from the grocery store, but it had been fermented in wine. So you want to make sure, too, that it's a raw, unpasteurized, for example, sauerkraut that hasn't been heated. There should be not, you know, no sugars added, no alcohol added. It should just be the salt and the vegetable. So I think I saw a chat asking if, if we need to repopulate our guts, say we had to take antibiotics because we got an infection and it's kind of maybe disturbed the colony and the ecosystem within our intestines. Um, what would you suggest, Jen? Yeah, for sure. Certainly, yes, antibiotics are necessary in life. And um, the unfortunate, the downfall to that is they do wipe us clean sort of of all bacteria, the good, the neutral, the bad, all of it. So in a way, you've got a good opportunity to rebuild yourself back up after that. And I do believe that to be quite crucial and, and critical at, at a time of recovery. Um, so again, food first is, is for me, I would choose food over any supplement any day. So I would look at trying to incorporate more fermented foods into my diet, if you can be open to that. It can even just be a nice, you know, um, a heaping tablespoon of a raw sauerkraut with, with your dinner, for example. Start there and see how that feels. But again, as Kirk mentioned, diversifying the types of fermented foods you're choosing too. Maybe a plain unsweetened yogurt added to your smoothie in the morning. Um, maybe a salad dressing made with apple cider vinegar. Again, an unpasteurized apple cider vinegar. So the more fermented foods you can incorporate, the more wide variety of, of, of bacteria you'll have in your microbiome and the better off you'll be. But I do think that that's that's great advice is to make sure you're repopulating after a course of antibiotics with fermented foods first and foremost would be my goal. And then those are the, those are the probiotic species in those foods. And then we've got to give them the prebiotics, which, which is the food that they want to eat. So that's where we get, again, a variety of foods. And you, you want to put some cabbage sliced super thin into your salad so that some of those bacteria can still get their cabbage to eat. Absolutely. Yes, that's part of the super plate. <laughs> mm -hmm. Jen, we've got another question about um, when you don't necessarily have access to organic. Sure. Um, is, is it better to eat traditional or conventional or is it best to skip it? And then specifically, what about if it's one of those that are on the dirty dozen? Is it just something you should always skip if it's not organic or is, are the nutrients sometimes they outweigh the potential pesticide? Yeah, no, and, and you know, it can become, I feel like sometimes it can get so, sort of so complicated, you know, and there's all these sort of rules and all these sort of guidelines to follow, but really I think it comes down to you're just doing the best you can. And if, if you're limited because of where you live or because of whatever situation, it, you know, is going on in your life, you're just going to choose the best that you possibly can. I personally would choose a, a whole food, even if it's a conventionally raised whole food over a packaged food. Personally, I feel like there's still going to be far more nutritional value in that whole food versus a packaged food, whether it's organic or not. I do think that the clean 15 and the dirty dozen lists, although the, they tend to vary depend on the, depending on the source, hold some validity. I think, again, it's kind of what's happening is that those natural plant protectors, like for example, the cruciferous family, the cauliflower, the, um, the kale, the chard, the, the sulfur kind of smell that you smell from those foods are also like um, insect repellents. So those foods aren't needing as many chemicals. Celery is a really good example of a food that, that oftentimes isn't attacked by very many bugs because it's so bitter. So I think, I think, yeah, trying to maybe incorporate more of those clean 15 foods um, or that list that tends to change can be really helpful, even if those foods aren't organic or as, mu as much as possible buying local, even if it's not certified organic, but it's local, again, they tend to have less chemicals. What about grains, Jen? Um, is there a spectrum of nutrient value of grains, quinoa, barley, Farro, do you have a, a favorite, something that you typically uh, yeah. don't do make? 
I, I feel, for example, like my, my son, he's growing, he's about to turn four, his metabolism, like I, I don't even know where the food goes. Um, I, I feed him a lot of complex carbohydrates for his little growing body. That, that, I'm just using his, him as an example. And I give him the most variety as possible. I mean, I'm cooking him buckwheat, um, amaranth, um, wild rice. Yeah, all of those different types of whole grains. Again, I feel like it's variety. They all offer such a different um, uh, nutri nutrition profile. If you were to compare them all, I mean, buckwheat, for example, is really high in iron. Quinoa tends to be, it's a cereal grass. It's a little bit higher, more higher in protein. So again, if you're kind of just choosing variety and not eating the same one every day, you're going to be much better off. And we do that at Mountain Trek. Every breakfast, we have a different complex carbohydrate. That means there's a different brand fiber around each one of those grains, whether it's pearl barley or amaranth um, or quinoa. And so again, we're feeding the bacteria different fiber so that we can get more of a diverse population of gut bacteria living off of that fiber. Um, so it's, it's, it's besides the minerals and vitamins that are different, there's going to be different fiber elements that are different and all uh, different amino acids, all of it. Again, spectrum is what is key. Absolutely. Um, I think we're just about going to here to wrap it up. Do you have one last question, Alex? I do. Um, and I'm curious about this myself. So when we go to local farmers markets, sometimes they play, play by their own rules and they're not gonna go out and get USDA organic certified, um, but they might not use pesticides. Um, do you have any rules around that or questions that you should be asking the farmer to, to really figure out what they're doing and what's best for us? You know, and you do oftentimes, and that's one of the, the things about talking to someone face to face is just, there's sort of this authentic, you know, um, vibe that you can get and you can kind of potentially build more trust and, and have and form a relationship with the person that's growing your food. And I think that's such a beautiful thing being connected to that. Um, sort of becoming certified organic is extremely expensive. So that can be really difficult for small scale farmers. You know, I mean, they're barely making it by and it's extremely hard work farming. So just because they can't necessarily afford to be certified organic doesn't necessarily mean that the food isn't organic. I mean, again, what does that word really mean these days? But again, not using chemicals, not using pesticides. So I think that that's something to remember. And some farms will clearly state that even on their labels, we're not certified organic, but we don't use, you know, and they'll give give their list. So I think that there can be some trust built between the, the farmer and the consumer. And I think it just is important to remember the, the high price tag that comes with certifying your food in an organic way. Great. Thank you so much, Jen. Oh, really my pleasure. Time. Thank you, Kirkland. Thank you too, Alex. Thanks a lot, Jen. Oh, my Thanks pleasure. All your questions and input, everybody. Yes, you guys. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. We'll be back in two weeks. Uh, if you have a topic in mind, put it in the chat. Um, otherwise, we'll see you here in two weeks. Sounds good. Take Bye. good care of yourselves, Thank everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye Wendy. Bye.